Hello everybody, and a very warm welcome to Rugby Reclined. A um, bit of a chit-chat with old friends, new friends, and it's a real pleasure this week. It's a show I've been wanting to do for a long, long time. Uh, to talk to the man, I was thinking before we started recording this, that I think he was the third autograph in my autograph book behind um, Cooch and Jeremy Guscott. So there's a pretty illustrious company there. A man who I worked with for 18 years, taught me most of the things that I know about media, and a whole lot more about life itself. It is a very warm welcome to the old warrior that is Professor Stuart Barnes. How are you? Yeah, too, too flattering, Alex. Thank you. Well, you know, every so often we, we like, we, we, I, didn't, I didn't learn niceties from you, let's put it that way, but I did learn a lot about a lot. Um, it's very nice to see you. How are you? It's pretty good. I mean, it's 23 degrees here in Wiltshire. We haven't had much sun so far. We haven't had much fun for a year and a half, so... Things are looking up this afternoon. What I love about this is that I can tell so much, or people will learn so much about you purely from the backdrop. First and foremost, the hat. That's is that an ode to Bob? Bob? It's it's not. No, it's it's probably an, it, Bob would be influential. Yes, I like my hats. Yeah. How has the last year and a half been? I mean, is it? I can't remember when we last actually spoke or chatted. It was probably a while ago, actually. But how have you found COVID? Have you have you? Have you tried new things? Have you have you just cracked into the rugby? What's what's been keeping you busy? No, I um I got a few projects going for the first sort of six months of the lockdown when there was almost a sense, wasn't there, of um, novelty, uh, mm. and then I had to um, get my fingers out of my derriere and do something with the work I'd done. So in true Stuart fashion, I came to a grinding halt, started reading, listening, and, and drinking. Um, there was also uh, the fact that we've had, it's been the longest season, um, not just for players, but journalistically, Al. I mean, what was there, about a week off? There, there was a couple of weeks when all rugby was locked down. And at that time, um, I came up with this stupid idea in the uh, um, Sunday Times to do top tens, be it players, great matches, and just, you know, just just to keep the thing ticking over, just to m remind the bosses that I had ideas in my head. And as is typical fashion, I'm thinking, oh, they're going to be one of, they're going to miss match reports. They're going to miss reviews, analysis, but they love these top tens. So that sort of took us into a new season and it hasn't really stopped from them. So it, it's been quite difficult um, until we got back to grounds. Um, and even if it was just sort of, laughing at the banality of coaches with their technical expertise, as in, come on, ref, he's offside, he's offside, and then a few expletives. And I'm thinking, they're getting paid 70, 80,000 pounds for saying something that some old fart on the terrace shouts every week, if they could go. If they could go, yeah. Um, I said earlier, I, I've been wanting to do this show for such a long time because... You, you and I have had many happy miles. I, I say happy miles. We've had many miles on the road. We've had many hours in outside broadcast trucks. We've had many hours at breakfast on game day. And I can't really think of many people I've spoken more to about rugby. But we never really spoke about you. And, you know, I, I was, you know, I mentioned the fact that in, whenever it was, 1988, when I started my autograph book, you were one of the first people in there. And I watched with great passion and enthusiasm, your glorious career with Bath. I watched, you know, I remember very clearly your, your day with England in 93, which I read something actually the other day that you'd, you'd written about that remarkable, remarkable game against Scotland. Watched you with the British and Irish Lions. And then you very much, for me and, and most of the people of my generation, became the voice of the game as it went from amateur to professional. And you have been there for the most iconic moments over the last... I'm going to say 25, 30 years. Yeah, you've right? been talking 25 and a bit. Yeah, you are. Is it really? Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I remember someone saying to me, um, the thing about you was that, you know, your opinion was sought and it was not always agreed with. But when, when the big story broke, when an England manager was sacked or when, you know, someone came to the end of their career or when a, a game didn't go the way it was meant to, People wanted to hear what Stuart Barnes had to say about it. And you became a sort of a reaction point to that, really. Mm. But there are so many things I want to, I want to uh, just talk to you about you, really. Um, obviously, you're very, very busy now with The Times and The Sunday Times and, and writing daily, weekly on everything. Does that sate you in the way that, you know, once you, you were 
here, there, and everywhere? Do you, do you get everything you want from the game in, in what you've got at the moment? I, I think so. Professionally, Al, I mean, I, I would say I was always um, more comfortable with the pen than the microphone um, in the sense that uh, I knew you had to have immediate reactions, but that was no excuse for not having well-considered and conceived uh, reactions, especially um, if you thought that you have to be strong in your opinion. Now, I say that because I thought my life from a kid who loved football from the age of eight to quit rugby at 31 was driven by sport. Nothing else mattered as much. And the moment I quit, I, I quit because I had an offer um, to work for the Daily Telegraph, not obvious partner with me but you know I, it was straight it was straight into fleet street as it then was and i was 31 and um i was thinking okay raul is in charge maybe i've got a, a crack at knocking rob out of the england spot i don't know but sometimes you've got to make decisions and i thought this is the time before the bigger names like carling and moore and andrew got out that someone who perhaps with a a, a strong opinion and an intelligent look at the game could get in. So I went in there and um, I always loved writing. You know, I, I was an arts person as opposed to an artiste like you at university. <laughs> and um, that's how it started. And I think it was because of the strength of opinions. Um, it wasn't because I was that famous. I was famous in Bath, but I was a sort of a five minute wonder in the in the bigger world of, uh, of British sport, you know, I know that. Uh, and I got an opportunity with Sky because they thought I could structure an argument and, and they thought it wouldn't be a bad idea to make me a presenter. Now that was a terrible idea because I had all these opinions and I recall doing a game wasps against someone or other and I had to go to the guest and ask for their opinions on things. So I was asking Jeff Probin what he thought about the wasp midfield combination. And at that moment, I'm thinking, I don't know whether I'm doing as well as I can for Sky. I certainly wonder whether Sky are getting the best out of me. And it soon became clear that commentating and um, analysing was a far stronger forte for me. And uh, we just, you know, we ticked the time with Durden Smith and Lazenby till the guru came along. <laughs> and, 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 and so Aggressively downhill, I think, in that regard. But... Um... So, yeah. So on, on that point, it, it you know, uh, you're, you're under pressure, I feel, to say not the right thing. There is no right or wrong, but your opinion has to be backed up and it has to be backed up with a degree of uh, articulation. Now, even when you've got to file on deadline for a newspaper, you still have time during the last 10, 15 minutes when there's a little injury or heaven forbid a referee is checking a forward pass that takes 20 minutes, you've got time to, to reassess what you're thinking and, and, and how you want to word it. When you commentate, you get one crack at it. And I've, I've always said to, to like Sunday writers who write live, when you commentate, you must be aware that, you know, it's a, it's a case of identifying what's happened, um, how it's happened, why it's happened, and what the implications are. So a lot gets rolled into that. So there's a lot of pressure on that. But there was also pressure... To, to say it in a, uh, I, I wanted to say it in a way that was fresh and original a lot because I care for words. And I, I must say by the end, I was still trying very hard, but it was getting bloody difficult. And I also felt that- uh, Why? Why was it getting bloody difficult? Well, well I think 25 years of, 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 of trying to say something fresh when yeah. um, sports broad, the, the, the medium, I think you'd agree, Alex, has become far more uh, driven by the younger ex-player and the um, uh, and the dressing room talk, coach talk. And so, you know, uh, all the time I'm thinking there were phrases that were being used, like counter-rocking. I'm thinking there's no such thing as counter-rocking. There's rocking. Now, for a year you can say that, but after that you sound start to sound like a bit of an old fart. Um, and... Yet you're thinking, I don't want to go back to just joining the gang and saying something that I think is inherently um, unthinking. So that's why I thought that was harder because um, the the words are gratifying if you're lucky enough to write a good column or a, a report 
um but there's it, it's 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 a it's a bruising experience if you take a broadcaster's job seriously and i thought if all i've done from the age of eight years of old when i first started playing football till the day i stopped broadcasting was play or talk about sport and if i didn't do it seriously then it was a pretty pointless existence because sport as we know is it's 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 uh what is it it's an escape isn't it mm. it's and everything and yet it's nothing if you know exactly it. but but because it's everything yet nothing nicely put as per normal L, it means it means you have to um treat it with respect and talk about it like it means something if you just talk as if it's nothing but a little bit of joke a bit of banter a, a word i hate then really what the hell are you doing with your life yeah interesting how do you um how do you look back at your your playing career oh um made a bit of a balls of it really <laughs> but but that's that's a very interesting thing to say because there are few people who can have claimed such a successful club career yeah. and yet few people who could have should have potentially would have had so much more at an international level i mean it's a uh, you didn't make a balls of it because you were part of one of the greatest English club sides of all time. Yes, that's Less true. Than possibly, you know, a Saracens of modern times. And yet you never quite managed to get what you needed or wanted out of that England shirt. No, no, I, I, I didn't. And, and what I should have done really is go there quietly when I was a 20 year old. I mean, when I was 20 and I was on the bench and Les Cousins was starting, I was sort of quietly griping, thinking... I'm the best player in this position at the moment. I should be playing. I should have just shut up, got on with it. And I got in the team and I didn't really feel any pressure when I made my debut against Australia because I thought it, I was, it was right that I should be playing. And, and, and then they dropped me and I don't think I took it as well as I, I should. I was angry about it rather than thinking, let's prove them wrong. And I think what I did, I went away uh, to Bath and I played some great rugby for them but you know, twice, twice I, I, I did the um, Bretta Garbo and told England to leave me alone. And you know, when you twice tell a national team you don't want to be a part of it, you can't whinge if you only end up with ten caps. Um, that's how it goes. So I think my temperament um, didn't help me. I think it, it didn't help that um, I felt England had players that should play it another way. I, I thought with Gus Scott and and Underwood. Uh, you, you had fantastic um, talents there. And I felt that England were beholden too much to their forwards. And when I look back at the way England played, probably they were driven by the pack. And I, I think they probably could have won a World Cup had they had more balance to their game. But overall, for a decade, I think, you know, I think Rob Andrew playing the England way was probably a better bet than Stuart Barnes playing the England way. Now, had it been, uh, I don't know, in a, a French or a New Zealand shirt, maybe it would have been the other way. But at the time, you don't always see it. You, you just see, I'm playing better than him. I should be him. He's not playing that well. Um, and, and it's a regret that I just didn't keep a little bit quiet and um, really just put the pressure on by turning up at training sessions and trying to get in like every other sane person does. It is it is amazing, though, because, I mean, it was one of the great rivalries, you and Andrew, in a way that modern sport doesn't really allow for that nowadays. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't generate two players going for one shirt who blatantly, quite openly have a disregard for each other. In, in the, everyone supports everyone. And I understand why the better man's got the shirt, etc. Is that true or not? disregard for the way they played it that's what i meant yes okay no, but no, I, I, no, as competitive no, rivals no. We, were you were you friends with rob off the field was it civil was it cordial was it anything more than that or was it just uh no, I, I don't i think there was too much went on around it for us to be friends but we were extremely cordial then uh and we are now and it was one of these things that the press liked to, to see this feud between us there was never a feud and um i i think he's a perfect and i i think as I got older, um, I respected what he did more and more. Again, because I saw it from a greater distance. I saw the work he put in to being who he could be. I think Rob maximised his talent. And, and for that, 
you know, I, I used to think people who, I, I used to like the sort of bandits in life. I wasn't one of those. Um, but as you get a bit older, I still like the bandits, you know, they're, they're still my natural habitat is hanging around with the banditos. But you see the people who work their butts off and get to the top and you have massive respect in a way you might not when you're in your early 20s. The other thing that I think is is notable about your era is that the characters were enormous. They were they were people whose reputations live on now. Graham Dorr, um, you know, Jeremy Guskett, the people you played with at Bath. You could go through that whole squad. They were huge characters as well as amazing players. And and the modern game doesn't, again, it doesn't allow for that. Social media shuts down anything in that regard. When, when you get together now with the old banditos that you played with. Give us a sense of the brotherhood. And I suppose as, as much those that you played with and adored for playing with, those who you, you played against, and, and I mean, in England context, I know that they were not always the happiest of times for you and some pretty big characters in that setup as well. Has that sort of levelled out now, 25, 30 years on? Or is there still an element of the old fire that remains? Well, to be honest, in terms of uh, rivalry, um I don't. I don't have any. I. It doesn't even cross my mind. You know, when when I go to a game in rugby now, my job is to write about it. It used to be to write about it and talk about it. Um, so that's sort of. I see someone. It's hello, hell, well met. And nothing else. You know, uh, they've gone their way and I've gone mine, and, and that's how it is. And and funnily enough, when we talk about the banditos, one of the strengths of Bath was the fact that we were committed to each other, playing and on the training field but we were disparate characters. So mm. we weren't naturally all great friends. And, you know, I think there's a lot of Bath players I played with for a long time who who wouldn't sort of go out of their way to see me. And there's a few I, I might not as well. Having said that, I, it, it's a sunny Tuesday night and I'm seeing Richard Hill, who's back from France, and Gareth Chilcott. So we, three people who had, uh, shall we say, an equal commitment to winning in in a, in a variety of ways. And it's always lovely to see them. Um, I love seeing Jerry. He's as cheeky as ever. Um, but it, it's a time that's gone. I am a great believer. That, you know, I hear people say oh, uh, uh, Stuart Hooper's bath or Bruce Craig's bath. It's not Stuart Hooper or Bruce Craig's bath in the same way it wasn't Jack Rowell or Stuart Barnes's or Gareth Chilcott's. Institutions like sporting clubs are not owned by anyone. Someone gets their hands on them for a bit and then they have to move away and it goes on. And for that reason, you know, Bath almost is like a different entity to me now. And looking back on the past, I think it's 25 years plus, you know, every now and again, I don't mind a little nostalgia, but you know, I think not, I think I'm still too young, uh, too much going forward in life to worry about what's what was going on in the past it was a golden golden decade you and bath um I do, and, and we've touched on England. I, I want to ask you about the lions because for the first time since 93 we won't see or hear you on a lion's tour we'll obviously all still read in terms of the times and the sunday times but just just you as a player first of all you mentioned you you, you made a bit of a mess of your career and and some of that was obviously self-inflicted but in 93 you were in the saturday team leading into the first test and then obviously the unfortunate happened um and you can explain a bit about that but if you had one is it a regret i don't know if there's one sliding doors moment would that be it probably yeah i mean as you as i was on the bench midweek against uh invercargill down in it's at southland down in invercargill Southland. and so you know i don't know ian mcgee might have had rob in mind to play all the time i'm not sort of saying i was lined up but I was in that position where more often than not, the players who weren't playing on that Tuesday were going to be starters. So I'm thinking, blimey, I might actually be getting somewhere on the international stage. And it sort of summed things up a little bit that with about eight minutes to go. I think Rob took a, a, a blow. Um, Southland liked to use their boots quite a lot. And Rob took one in the, in the snozzle and thought he'd had a broken nose. So I came on with about seven metres left, seven minutes left. And uh, Rob Jones, one of my closest friends in that Lions party, McGee can work really hard on our, um, uh, rucking, our rucking technique because of New Zealand rucking at the time. 
And Jonesy was the only bloke with shorter legs than me. And he, he went to put his leg over my head to protect me. And he just caught me on the temple and he opened me up. And, you know, I had, I, I, I don't know how many stitches, but I'm sure you've seen it and taken the mick out of me. There's that picture with a stupid turban. I played against Taranaki in the Tuesday with a turban on. But, you know, it was like a, it was like a bullseye mark there. And, you know, I think I even said to McGeek, and I, I wouldn't feel confident playing against New Zealand. I think they'd have zeroed me up. Like I say, that's not saying I was unlucky. I would have played, but it was a, it, it, it was, it was a, a bad moment. And I, while not wishing Rob to have his nose um, smashed all over his mush, I wish he'd stayed on for another eight minutes and we'd have seen what we'd have seen then. Yeah. How how the doors can can change and, and paths can, can can change I suppose with the with the clip of a boot, um, but from ninety three obviously I mean you did you join you joined Sky in ninety four and I have such amazingly vivid memories of some of your earliest earliest work in what can only be described as a burgundy blazer uh, on Pulteney Bridge and it was it was cult fodder in the early years at Sky to see the early Stuart Barnes showreel. It was an amazing thing, Alex, because. I came straight in from being a, a player. Um, I think we beat Leicester. Did Bath beat Leicester to win a double. I went to South Africa on tour, which for me was um, fascinating and, 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 and exhilarating because I always had a uh, great belief in the ANC and Mandela. And if you remember, they just had their first democratic election. So that was the most exciting, uh, stimulating tour I'd ever been on. But I came into Sky, and, and you're quite right. The Ron Burgundy blazer was Burgundy before. I, in fact, I, I think the film may have taken the idea. Well, it, it's right. a, it, the parallels are extraordinary. We'll have to dig it oh. out and stick it on our socials. But, but the the other thing is, we, we, we used to have, an, it was either 45-minute build-up or an hour off air or the other way around. I think it was the other way around. And I had no experience of television whatsoever. And... I'd learned my links into and out of breaks. And, and, you know, you get those right and you get the flow on it. And we've always said, imagine working for the BBC where you don't have to say, right, we're going to a break, come back from a break. No one told me that I had to learn absolutely everything. And I was so committed to doing this professionally that I learned it all. But what I wasn't was a, a, a very good actor. You know, I was never Macbeth in the school play. What were and you? I, you weren't in charge of the lighting, were you, up, up back? No, I, I, like I, that's technology, Alex. Yeah, true. That that's never going to come no, together. No, no, no. So I I was never great at that. So I was a little bit wooden. And I can remember everyone used to laugh and say, "Christ, your delivery was terrible." And I tell you, but I learned everything and I remembered it all. And I just I couldn't bear the thought of of just getting one word wrong. And 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 you and I know we get thousands wrong through the careers doing it, and and nobody even notices. But yeah, I was yeah. trying so hard to get welcome to Sky Sports for our opening day of Premier Rugby. I'm at my old hunting ground, the Recreation Ground, <laughs> and I thought oh, that was bloody good. Time I take you know taped it, got home, saw it again, and thought, oh Jesus Christ, how long till they get rid of me? And, and thank God they sort of found a better role for me. <laughs> they certainly did. You as a broadcaster, you you very much had the space um, in the early year of your uh, years of your career, almost to sort of to have it as your own. I mean, obviously Dow was alongside you, but he played a very different role at Sky to you. You know, you were the, the crisp, cutting, ruthless analyst, and he was very very good at man in pub, teammate, team talk, etc. You, you took very different roles. Yeah. Um, and then obviously the game changed and more people came to the party and more 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 voices were heard and social media arrived and everyone suddenly had the chance to put a, a voice and an opinion out there. So for you personally, that, that's quite a journey that you've been on, you know, with the way that you've written and the way that you've spoken around rugby. What what was your the sort of criteria for you by which you set your stall out? in the way that you've analysed the game over the years? Because you've taken no prisoners and you've upset people no. along the way. You've praised, every, you know, rightly, some amazing players as well. But you, you've always walked your own line. You've never bowed to what public opinion was and you've never been swayed by what other people have, have tried to convince you. How did you set your stall out as a broadcaster and a journalist? Uh, I, I always remembered uh, 
uh, there was a line, the poet, I can't remember, but the line was the, uh, the mob can air as grossly as the few. And I always thought that and people used to say, well, everyone thinks you're wrong. And I think well, everyone can bugger off. I don't, don't care. I, and, you know, and I, politely, I, I would suggest that I was working six days a week, watching rugby, talking to coaches, getting training sessions, talking to players, watching games again, not not looking at games, but watching them deep. So I, I tried to watch it uh, with every bit of forensic detail that any coach would. Um, and, and I think you've got to do that because if you stop playing and you're not coaching, if you just watch a game or you watch a bad game and say, that's a load of old crap, so I'll, I'll go to the next one. That's no good. And I always used to say that to all the people who came after me, ex-players, to Sky. The most important games to analyse are the bad ones because... What most people tend to see are the highlights reel. Like they, they, you know, you see the highlights of everything. So everyone knows so-and-so is brilliant because he scored two tries, but they didn't see that the winger missed four kicks behind him and didn't know whether to step in or stay out. And those are the crucial moments. And so, first of all, I, I think to, to do the job as well as I wanted to do, it took a great amount of, of work. And I think that was a bit like playing. I, I like to kid people that I never trained, but I actually did train quite hard. And I like to pretend that I just rocked up for a, a broadcast, but I didn't, you know, I was, I, I put a lot of hours in and you have to do that. I mean, you have to, if you want to be good, you've got to work bloody hard. Uh, then I think there's the entertainment factor and it's not entertaining, entertaining just to sort of go along with the flow to buy what the coach is saying, because he's got a massive reputation you got to say, has he got something wrong there? And it's more interesting if you can find a way to say, I feel he might have this wrong. Uh, you know, Eddie Jones is, is journalistically the best thing that's happened to independent-minded rugby writers for a long time uh, because he's done some brilliant things and he's done some desperate things. Uh, but it's, you know, it takes a, a, a long time for a lot of people to stand up and criticise a national coach. Um I don't have any worry with that because, like I say, you know, somebody else might be working five days a week in whatever aspect uh, they do. They'll know that inside out. They'll know that really well. I wouldn't question them. Now, I'm in sport and everyone's got an opinion and they rock up on a Saturday or a Sunday game and they watch the game and they're entitled to their opinion. But they haven't really put the time in. And you, there is this polite aspect, which is, you haven't really, you look, you see a bit, but you're not looking. And it's a massive difference, you know, and I'm not one of these people who says, unless you've been in the changing room, you can't know. There are a number of very fine uh, rugby writers who never played the game to any level, but had an empathy for the game. In the same way, you can be an ex-player and be an absolutely useless bloody broadcaster or journalist. You have to have that, that feel for the game. But I'd say two things, Al, really. You had to work really hard. You had to look for the bad things instead of just let the good things glaze over. And you had to be able to say, I don't care if 58 million people think I'm wrong. If I believe that, I'm going to go with it. And people, I think one of the words that used against me uh, in a derogatory sense more than any other is contrarian. And I'd say two things there. One, I don't believe I am a contrarian because... My view is not taken by what other people say uh, or what teams are picked. It's purely my thought. And secondly, uh, there's an element in which this world needs its contrarians. Absolutely. You know, it, 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 it's a dangerous place if you don't have someone who stands up to authority. And I am only talking sport, but in a broader, more general sense, you know, in life, we need people to say bollocks. That's nonsense. A um, couple of quick fires to finish. Who's going to be the star from the Lions' perspective? Um, who's going to be the Lions' star? If the Lions are going to win this series, they're going to have to stand up in the second row and back row particularly. Um, I've long thought that Sam Underhill is England's finest open side, and I still think if I'm fully fit, he might just be. Uh, but the form of curry and the consistency and, and the fury that he brings to his game suggests that if 
if the Lions are going to win, someone's going to have to get to Faf and they have to get all over him. And they're going to have to do a job on uh, Khaleesi for psychological reasons. And I'm looking at uh, Tom Curry in a team probably um, deprived of many Englishmen. I see Curry as being absolutely central. Sale on sale, which is an yes. interesting subplot. Um, okay, and just a couple on on the years gone by. The the game that stands out above all others as a broadcast, as a broadcast, and as a as an occasion, and as a God, I wish I could bottle that and drink from it again. Well, as an occasion, can I cheat and have a couple? You can have as, yeah, an, I'll give you, I'll give as, a, as an occasion, and as a writer, um, I would have to say. Uh, the World Cup final because the Northern Hemisphere has suffered so badly and despite what my uh, many critics say, I am English and it was a very exciting day. To Just to clarify, in... we're talking about 03 here, not 19 or we 07 are talking, or we're 91. Talking, we're talking about 03 and yeah. the only disappointment was the Australian fans took it so well and I was trying to tell English fans when it was over, they're only taking it well because they lost. Had they won, they'd be ramming it to you. So I'm disappointed that fellow Englishmen didn't go and and celebrate. So that was probably, uh, as an occasion, the greatest game would be, you are better than me on these things, dates. I've got lost with dates, especially this last year and a half. Um, I would think it was a decider in the Tri-Nations in Joburg, Sky, Sky fell for it. I told them they should be sending Miles and myself to Joburg for South Africa versus New Zealand. And to my joy, they bought it. Uh, and oh, I, I reckon think that was 2014. South Africa, 2014, New Zealand. Nigel Owens refereeing, yeah. South Africa, New Zealand. Kid called Bar Barrett got run over by... That's uh, right. Uh, by um, Jean de Villiers. Jean de Villiers for a try. I can remember saying in commentary, you know, you get it wrong. He said, ah, it's all well and good, looking good at provincial level this is a step up two minutes later he runs through all the spring box for a score and i think this barrett bloke can play but that was <laughs> um that was the uh, um in in terms of pace excitement uh quality of refereeing uh, atmosphere that was a game that made me celebrate the fact that in the 20 years from me retiring as an amateur to the game getting to where it was professional the gap was as it should be immense yeah. because sometimes I watch games and yes, everyone's faster and they're fitter and their skill levels are great. Um, but decision making and, and, and bits and pieces go out the window and you think rugby isn't far enough away from amateurism. That game, it was another sport completely. And, and it was lovely to be, to be, to be from the North there just sitting back, and calling this glorious game glorious and the one player in their pomp that you would pay to watch again um you probably know better than me uh well i thought you'd go simpson daniel because for many years we all thought that he was your love child but bod lomu barrett cullen uh, I think you've just you've just done it for me there. Uh, I, I think Christian Cullen, um, Lomu was just a, a freak of nature. He was a brilliant rugby player. Cullen was a normal bloke. He was actually even a bit small. His running lines, his change of direction, his strength. He scored a try when uh, I first saw him in Hong Kong Sevens final. And, and the days when Fiji were number one and New Zealand were chasing them. And Sarevi was God. Everyone loved Sarevi. Nobody wanted the All Blacks to win. And I was commentating on that game with Mars. It was my first commentary weekend. And he had the ball in his own dead ball line and he was just running around waiting. And about three Fijians came and he just ghosted past them all. And he just lined up Sarevi and he, he, he went off his left, his right, his left, his right. And I think Sarevi fell over almost sort of as if he got caught in his shoelaces. And it was like, see you, mate. This guy is the king of sevens. And about a year later, he was doing things that to this day, I, I still don't think we've seen. So I, I would, yeah, I, I definitely would say Christian Cullen. It's a lovely net watch to end. It's been very nice to catch up. I'm conscious your, your chilled rosé is, is, 
is perhaps losing some of its chill. So we must we must let you go. Until then, keep writing your great writings. Um, <laughs> your your opinion is the tallest poppy in the field, and it will ever be so for, for those You're of us who are watching, listening to you. And um, look after yourself. You're a flatter. Thank you, Al. Take care. Thank you.